I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Roger Brutal, who is the founder and chairman of Capital Economics. It's one of the largest economic consultancies in the world. He's a regular columnist for the Daily Telegraph and was also special advisor to the House of Commons Treasury Committee for 20 years until last year. He's been uh, termed one of the wise men, so a good person to listen to and get his thoughts on things. Um, he's also written several books. I've already seen some of you buying copies of them, but they are for sale at the Daunt book stand in the Education Centre, and he will be doing a book signing in the next break. So on that note, I'm delighted to welcome Roger Brutal. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be asked to speak to you on this absolutely fascinating subject. Uh, I've been billed as talking to you with a positive view of post-Brexit Britain, and that's what I'm going to give you, but I'm not going to start, I'm afraid, with something positive, because I'm going to start by talking about the EU. There's a widespread misconception that the EU has been a great economic success story. It hasn't. It is true that in the early years after it was established, it did register very rapid rates of growth, far more rapid than we enjoyed here in the UK. And that's one of the leading reasons why we joined. Uh, people not knowing the numbers tend to think, well, we've all been getting better off, haven't we? You know, everyone's much better off than they were 30 or 40 years ago, so surely the EU must have been very good. Well, it's very difficult to disentangle, of course, cause and effect. I don't want to overdo this. But if you compare the economic growth rate of the EU against almost any economic area in the world, you will discover that the EU has done comparatively badly. I'm not talking about against the emerging markets, superstars like China. I'm talking about the United States, Canada, Australia, Switzerland. I mean, quite extraordinary how it has not done very well. Now, um, going back a few decades, the reason for that, I think, and the underperformance was not very big, by the way, the going back a few decades, the reason there, I think, is uh, probably to, mainly to do with regulatory overkill and an anti-business culture with European elites dominated by thoughts about harmonisation and convergence and setting up Euro this and Euro that. Meanwhile, in East Asia, funnily enough, the leaders of those countries were concerned more about and focused on the fundamental generators of economic growth. So in those earlier years, that's what I think was really at fault. But more recently, it's something much bigger than that, and the underperformance is much bigger. That big thing is the euro, which I call the greatest self-inflicted wound in the whole of economic history. Now, it's well known that uh, what the euro has done has caused great problems in the southern European countries, particularly Italy, whose economic performance is dire. I well remember when Britain chose not to join the euro, and we were told by all and sundry, BBC, the FT, do I say, uh, The Economist, uh, heaven knows whoever else, various American banks, Japanese car manufacturers, etc. If we didn't join, it would be a disaster because the whole of the rest of Europe was going to be carried forward on a wave of prosperity brought about by such things as being able to compare the price of pizzas in different countries without using a calculator. Well, look at the results of this great wave of prosperity. It's very interesting. Since the euro was formed in 1999, uh, out of a group of uh, leading eurozone countries, who's the top performer? Well, it's one that's not in the euro, namely the UK. 40% odd uh, GDP has grown since the euro was formed. France and Germany more like 30%, and Italy languishing down there, benefiting, of course, from this great wave of prosperity, languishing down there at about 9%. This has been a total disaster. A lot of people say things like, you know, oh, well, you, don't, you, can't, you can't blame the EU for the euro. It's the euro. You know, there's nothing wrong with the EU itself. That's just the euro. The euro was chosen by the European elites. That's what they thought was the most important thing to do. And what does that tell you about the structures of the EU, about its decision-making capacity, about the elites, what they're interested in doing? They chose the euro. It was totally unnecessary, and it's deeply damaging. And the second and potentially more serious way in which it's damaging is not so much the southern European countries like Italy, but Germany allowing Germany to get away with a current account surplus of over 8% of GDP, which wouldn't have happened in the old days. Supposedly, exchange rates are terribly bad. But I'll tell you what would have happened if Germany had kept the Deutschmark. It would have gone up. And the result of that is that Germany would not have a current account surplus of 8% of GDP. And uh, 
The other countries in Europe, including the UK, would have been trading uh, in a more balanced way with Germany. And indeed, that's true of the whole world. German surplus is now the biggest in the world. It's a bigger problem than China. And potentially, this threatens the open world trading system because we know what Trump's reaction to all this is. And he's liable to impose yet more damaging, damaging tariffs. Now, I think the euro is absolutely critical to this decision of the UK's to leave, and it's critical to our future outside the EU, because the eurozone essentially has got a choice. It's either got to move forward to full integration, that includes political and fiscal union, or it's going to break up. Now, I don't know which of those is going to happen. My money is on the latter. I think it will break up. But either way, we're far better off out of the EU in general than we would be if we were in the EU, either re resisting being drawn into the euro, which would, I think, have been a, a serious risk, or picking up the pieces from the outside. I also think it's worth bearing in mind that the EU is not uh, a constant, unchanging body in another sense. The regulatory overdrive, which has been so much of a problem during its existence, is, I think, likely to continue and maybe even intensify. We heard from Tim Harford earlier on about robots and AI. It's a fascinating topic. Indeed, it's the subject of my next book, which you can't buy at the moment. Uh, but what is the EU going to be like in relation to robots and AI, do you think? Bearing in mind the history, bear in mind everything, trade policy, common agricultural policy. What do you think the prevailing attitude of the European elites is going to be to robots and AI? I can tell you. Stop them. Tax them. Regulate them. Protect jobs. And the result is going to be, I suspect, that Europe will be among the laggards in the development of robotics and AI. Why is it that the EU is as it is, inclined I would argue, to make bad decisions. I don't want to pretend to you that I think the EU's been a bad thing. I mean, there are some people on my side of the debate who think the EU is the worst thing ever to happen to mankind. I don't believe that. And indeed, I think if the EU had not happened, the world would be a worse place. Although I'm an economist, I interpret everything historically. And interesting, Tim does as well, I think. Uh, I look at the history. And I think the EU performed a valuable political service geopolitical service. It, I think, helped to contribute something to the stabilisation of Europe after the war. I don't know about keeping the peace, but at least it didn't go in the opposite direction and helped some European countries to avoid communism. More importantly, it acted as a receiving house from what I call the refugee countries from the former Eastern Europe and Soviet Union. It gave them something to aspire to, it told them what they had to do, it drew them in and therefore brought them back into the normal Western ambit. And for that, I give the EU very high marks. That's what I think is its historical destiny and its geopolitical function, and it's over. But with regard to the promotion of prosperity, I think it's been nothing short of a disaster. So, enough of the negatives. What about the positives? What are we going to be able to do once we've left the EU, assuming that we do? Now, let me say to you, uh, it's very important to get a perspective on this because I think on both sides of this debate, I'm ashamed to say, there's been a lot of exaggeration and a lot of misinformation. Leaving the EU is not, in a flash, going to transform British economic performance or anything else. It will not cure your gammy leg, improve your sex life, drive up UK productivity growth to 5% per annum. It won't do any of these things. It's not a magic wand. But there are certain things, quite specific things, we can point to. Now, let's first of all focus on the money, the well-known 350 million a week. Well, it was never really mm, debate about that. I would say accurately 350 million a week. That roughly corresponds to Britain's gross contributions, but of course we get money back from the EU. I think it's better to think in terms of the net contribution, which was about 10 billion quid a year and set to rise over coming years and decades. Now, the first thing is, we'd get that back. We wouldn't pay it. But actually, that's the small beer. This is typical of economics, I think, in a way. The debate focuses on the thing that's measurable, that's precise. And even this isn't, as we already heard, precisely pin downable, but at least it's a you know, reasonably hard number. Actually, it's the small beer of what this is really about. What it's really about is the freedom to run your economy in an appropriate way. So the second big thing that leaving the EU will enable us to do is to run our own trade policy. That's to say, assuming that Mrs May negotiates a proper Brexit. 
A lot of people suggest that the EU is a free, free trade area and that belonging to it is about the promotion of free trade. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's not a free trade area, it's a customs union. And what that means is it does encourage free trade between its members and it discourages trade between its members and the rest of the world. Basic economics, this, goes back a long way. And it's all about the balance of these advantages. And maybe it's the case when Britain joined, it was the right thing to do. I voted to stay in, actually, in 75. Uh, I thought the balance of advantages then lay with remaining in the EU. But I think the change, the change since then, I mean, many changes, one has been that the EU has diminished massively in relative importance. But it's also changed its character. It's become more intrusive with regard to regulations, more bent on harmonisation, all those things, and political objectives, and less about the benefits of free trade. So the first thing, regaining control over our trade policy. We're in a customs union, which is actually protectionist, and it's protectionist in a very complicated way. Um, I'm often asked about the European Common External Tariff, and uh, when I heard about that first some time ago, I was embarrassed when I realised I didn't know what the figure was. I thought, you told said, what is the, the rate? I thought, well, Bootle, you must know. You know, you're an economist for 30-odd years. You must know, what is it? You know, 4.8, 12.2? What is this rate? So I started to investigate. And then I realised just how naive I'd been. Well, there isn't a single European tariff. The word common just means that all members have to impose it. It doesn't mean to say there's one rate. On the contrary, there's more than a 1,000 rates. There are 12 different rates for coffee. Is it roasted? Is it unroasted? Is it decaf? Is it not? Is it beans? Is it ground? And so we go on. And by the way, the structure of the tariffs is quite clearly developed so as to keep out, to, to penalise producers in the third world who are competing with Europeans you know, to make sure that they only do the basic stuff and don't do the value-added uh, activities to get the coffee in a state that European consumers want to buy it. It's a very complex regime. We can have done with all of that. It would be up to us to decide what to do, but I think we would, have, well, we would have the opportunity, and I think we would seize it, to move towards free trade in one of two ways. First of all, signing free trade agreements with umpteen countries around the world, and secondly, the possibility that if and when that doesn't happen, or doesn't happen on sufficient scale, declaring unilateral free trade ourselves a policy that was followed by Britain in the 19th century after the abolition of the Corn Laws. Next, we can set our own regulations. Now, that doesn't mean to say not having any regulations. It just means setting regulations that are appropriate to the British case and taking due regard for the consequences intended and unintended, rather than being subject to this steamroller in Brussels that spews out these regulations of massive intrusiveness and huge cost which is hated, by the way, across the whole of the EU. And this has a significant economic uh, cost. I've already mentioned robots and AI. I think potentially we are going to see some very intrusive regulations in that field. And then lastly, of course, we'll be able to control migration. Now, this doesn't mean to say no inward migration. That, I think, would be a mistake. But it does mean ending the discrimination in our migration policy that allows people to come in from the EU without limit while imposing tight limits on immigrants from outside the EU. We will be able to construct our own immigration policy that's appropriate to our circumstances. Now, I'm not going to be able to go into uh, all sorts of positives and negatives and the fate of particular industries, but I do believe that this whole debate is awash with people misrepresenting what's going on, and none more so with regard to the fate of the city of London. You all heard that all these banks that are you know, about to decamp to all these European centres and... Ah, oh dear, the fate of the city of London is awful. Not that the whole economy uh, is wrapped up in the city of London. I've heard it before. They said the same thing, by the way, about the euro. I had part deba in debates, one in particular in the Mansion House, where they were, they were prophesying gloom and doom. In fact, the city has prospered like never before after they joined the euro and we stayed out. But still, they're at it again. And now, of course, they've got, a, I suppose, a leading argument, and they say that there's a major challenger to the city of London. As and when we withdraw, we're in deep trouble. We risk losing large amounts of our financial services industry. What they mean, of course, is that across the water lies Frankfurt. There it is, shimmering like Croydon. <laughs> and if there's anyone here who comes from either Frankfurt or Croydon, you better see me later. There's no chance that Frankfurt can take over from the city of London. Anyone who's been there knows that perfectly well. No chance whatsoever. 
And similar factors apply to other industries that are potentially at risk, which do please ask me about later. Now, I believe that logic suggests that um, as and when we leave the EU, we should be clearly embarking on uh, a regime of low taxes and light regulation, which doesn't mean no regulation. Now, unfortunately, the, this logic is not necessarily accepted by leading members of the government, including the Prime Minister. So I think this is all to play for. I've tried to emphasise to you that Brexit is not the road to riches, nor the road to perdition. It's a series of challenges and opportunities. It can be done badly, and there's a certain person lurking in the wings who I think would do it badly. But I firmly believe that as long as we meet these challenges and seize the opportunities, then Britain is going to be much better off. Some people have been, uh, argued uh, over the last couple of years that the people like me who supported Brexit, we're little Englanders. Nothing could be further from the truth. The vision of Britain after we've left is of a global Britain, self-confident, focusing again on trading with all of the world. Thank you very much.